नमस्कार फ्रेंड्स वेलकम टू दिस सेवेंथ लेक्चर ऑन द सीरीज ऑफ इंजीनियरिंग साइकोलॉजी इन द फर्स्ट सिक्स लेक्चर्स वी हैव लुक्ड एट द हिस्ट्री ऑफ इंजीनियरिंग साइकोलॉजी एंड रिसर्च मेथडोलॉजीज विच आर यूज इन सॉल्विंग प्रॉब्लम्स रिलेटेड टू इंजीनियरिंग साइकोलॉजी वी हैव ऑल्सो लुक्ड एट विजुअल डिस्प्लेस एंड there we try to understand the capabilities and limitations of the human visual system we looked at in detail the composition of the human visual system the functioning of the human visual system and some limitations of the human visual system further we looked at how to design visual displays what are the best practices for designing visual displays which are efficient legible visible and provide enhanced support to operators towards the end of the last lecture we looked at two other sensory display system which is the tactile related to the touch sensation and the olfactory which is related to the smell sensation continuing on from the last class we will discuss in detail in today's lecture the auditory sense this lecture will be in two parts part 1 will look at the human auditory system where i'll discuss and try to explain to you the human auditory system and how does it function some of its nature and some other fundamental principles related to audition in the second lecture i will talk about how these principles limitations and capabilities of the human auditory system can be engineered and modified in designing auditory displays and auditory warning signs so let's begin audition is an important part of human lives just as the visual system is important and it provides you a number of information from the environment which helps you in your day to day activities the auditory system complements the visual system in some means the visual system is better than the auditory system but in some other means the auditory system is better than the visual system one primary difference between the visual and auditory system is that in vision a lot of information can be provided in a very brief period of time this will help in encoding a lot of information very quickly but on the processing end it will take a lot of time to process all this information also if a lot of information is presented to you very quickly then your attention would move around all this information and so there are high chances that some of the elements will not be paid a lot of attention to they will skip the attentional filter audition on the other hand make sure that whatever information is being sent to you you pay full attention to it so when paying focus or paying attention is the requirement of a job the auditory channels are better visual channels are fast auditory channels are slow let me demonstrate this basic difference let's say that i write this sentence ram is
going to the village. Now, let us assume that I display this sentence to you. It is easy for you to see this sentence written and if you have basic literacy, you will be able to make meaning of this sentence in terms of the fact that there are certain noun words here, there are certain action words which is verb and there are certain object word which is being referred to. In very simple sense, the sentence talks about a person called Ram who is doing the action of going to a place called village. Now, this sentence can be presented very quickly in one hundredth of a second in front of you and you will be able to see this sentence and extract meaning. But imagine that the same sentence I am trying to speak it out to you. Now, when I speak this sentence out to you, I will have to do it in a serial way. So, I will start with Ram first and then is and then going and then to then the village. Now, till the point of time that I have arrived from Ram to the village, this sentence will make no meaning. If I just end my sentence with Ram, it has no meaning, it is just a noun. If I say Ram is going, it is a clause, but it tells you that a person is going where incomplete information. So, till the point of time that I tell you where who is go doing what and where is this action taking place or how is this action taking place, you will not be able to differentiate or make meaning of the sentence. So, in this way the visual channel can give you a lot of information in very quick time, but the auditory channel takes a lot of time to display information or provide information. But this advantage is not so much of an advantage in certain situations. Visual channels require you to look at the stimuli. If a visual input is provided to the back of your head, you will not be able to see it and this property does not bound the auditory channel. A sound which is coming from anywhere around you can be perceived. So, sounds have 360 degree perception, whereas visual channels make sure that the people look at the visual display and only then the meaning is extracted. Now, this was an example to show to you how these two channels differ and how these two channels help in processing of information around the world. Now, with this distinction, let us start understanding the visual system and describing some of the basics of the visual system in humans. Why are visual system important? If you are crossing the road, you are looking all around you for signals which regulate traffic. You are looking at the road to find the zebra crossing and you are looking at other people who are walking with you and when is a good time to cross the road. You also look for those buttons on uh, the traffic light posts which you press and which signal a traffic controller somewhere else sitting that somebody wants to cross the road. So, he would then turn the light off for the traffic and uh, enable the walking light. So, you, you are looking all around you, but it is not only the visual system that you are using while you are crossing the road or walking on the road. You are also hearing sounds. So, you hear the loud horn of a vehicle which has approached too close to you and that startles you and you stop crossing the road. Even after looking around you and 
scanning the road for those warning signals which tell you when you should walk. Sometimes you miss some of this and the auditory channel is an addition to this visual signal. So, auditory channels are very important. They complement visual channels and in very few cases they work against the visual channels. So, first let us look at what is a sound. Visual channels have the encoding stimuli which is called a sound. So, what is a sound? The sound represents an important source of information that can convey unique and redundant information shared by other scenes. Those warning signals that you have on your car which warn you that you have not put on the seat belt, those clicking sounds that you hear when you back up your car are to warn other people that somebody is backing the car. Those ding sounds on the microwave oven which signal that uh, cooking of a food has finished and even when you are not near the micro, uh, microwave oven, you get this information that the cooking has finished and so you can plan your next move. So, sound convey unique information and at many times it convey redundant information, those information which has already been conveyed by the visual system. The ding of the elevator when it reaches your floor is in addition to the display of the elevator sign which tells you that the elevator has arrived and there are many a times that even if the elevator has arrived, we wait for the ding sound to tell you that the elevator has already arrived. So, sound then conveys unique and both redundant information. It is not that sounds only convey these kind of warning signals. Close your eyes and hear the sounds around you. If you do that, you will hear a lot of sound and not only that, by just hearing people talking next to you, you will be able to pinpoint who is talking, whether it is a male or female, whether it is a kid or a grown up what kind of mood is he in because certain emotional characteristics are conveyed by uh, sound. So, if he is speaking too fast, if he is stressed, if he is speaking in a more uh, balanced manner with laughs interpieced between two conversations, he is happy and that kind of a thing. So, sounds not only convey individual identity, it also conveys emotional state a hearty laugh, a cry and there are sounds for each of it, the whizzing sound, all of this convey certain emotional states. Not only these, but movements are also conveyed by sound and locations are also conveyed by sound, movement as in when you are moving. So, the moving car creates a sound or your movement creates a sound which tells you that the legs have started moving. For location, different locations are different sound. If you are in a quiet room, the sound around you will tell you that you are in a quiet room, but if you are on a railway platform or a rail station, train station, the sounds will be very different. So, locations and distances in space can also be represented through sound. So, sound in all conveys a lot of meaning. Sound make us aware of the normal operation of devices. Sounds can work as warning systems. If you look at the computer which is near you, when it is normally functioning, the sounds are different. But as soon as the hard disk starts making those rough sound as, is, as in something is being scratched onto, you immediately come to know that the hard disk is not in the correct state. The bicycle that you ride, when it creates the heavy sound, you come to know that the chain of the bicycle has gone off and you have to get down and uh, repair this chain. So, 
not only individual identity and other personal characteristics, certain informations or the state of a system are also conveyed by sound. How is sound produced? It is produced by the vibration of an object in its surface. A best example is to look at microphone diagrams. So, all of you have seen those older microphones and those old speakers which are used in marriages. These are huge speakers which have a central magnet and around it there is a whole carbon mesh fiber surrounded. We used to play when we were children by putting some liquid on this mesh around the central magnet of this speaker. And when you play this speaker very loudly, these liquid will jump, it will show dancing motion. A best example to understand sound is this speaker. The movement of those black surface outside the magnet creates the sound. As it vibrates up and down due to the action of this magnet, the air molecules near the surface closely attached to this black outer layer of the speaker, they start vibrating and these vibrations are then transferred through the air to the pinea of your ears, to the external part of your ears and the process of hearing happens. So, sound is basically produced by the vibration of objects or its surfaces. How does it happen? There is a back and forth vibration of the surface which disturbs the adjacent air molecules producing region of high and low pressure that propagate away from the vibrating surface. As just explained, when something vibrates, it creates disturbances in the air adjacent to that surface and so the air pressure keeps on increasing and decreasing. Now, this creates a simple sinusoidal wave if it is a simple tuning fork or if it is a musical instrument it creates complex sounds, but let us take the example of a tuning fork. So, this tuning fork disturbs the air molecules around it and then this low and high pressure gets transferred as a simple sinusoidal wave through the medium of air and then it reaches your ear. This is how sound is, sound is produced. So, how is sound expressed? Sound is generally expressed in terms of vibrations. How many times a particular arm of a tuning fork vibrates? In one minute, how, does, how many times it vibrates? This is called the frequency. The number of vibrations, the number of movements that an object which is producing sound does in one minute is called the frequency of that particular sound wave. So, frequency is expressed in vibrations and it is expressed in terms of something called hertz and cycles per second. Cycle per second is equal to how many vibrations an object producing sound does in one minute or one second, whichever time you are using. So, cycles means how many lows and high pressure or how much movement from the central axis does the object producing sound makes. So, this is cycles per second. Now, in terms of the experience of sound, the psychological dimension of sound, the frequency is expressed in terms of pitch of a sound. The more number of vibrations a particular surface does, the higher the pitch, whereas the more intense a sound is, the more loud a sound is, is equivalent to the concept of amplitude in sound. So, most sound waves or most waves have two basic features on which they are distinguished. One is called the frequency, the other is called the amplitude. Frequency is the number of vibrations, amplitude is how high the waves move from the central axis from the 0 point or the difference between a 
highest peak and the lowest peak that is called the amplitude in terms of the expression frequency is pitch and amplitude is loudness. So, then how do we measure sound? The measurement of sound is done in terms of the amount of force which is being applied to make motion on a surface is called sound and this is expressed in terms of Newton per meter square. So, sound is equivalent to the amount of force that I apply on a surface which is creating the sound divided by the area. So, disc desk that I am sitting on if I just tap on it you are hearing a very low sound because the pressure that my finger is putting on this desk is low and the area of the uh, desk is big. But if I thump my hand a larger sound comes in. Why? Because the amount of force that I am putting now is more and the area still remains the same. So, with one finger tap a lesser sound is produced, but with a more pressure a larger sound is being produced. So, sound is basically the amount of force applied divided by the area and it is expressed in Newton per meter square. Generally, but this definition of sound is difficult to apply to all measurements of sound. So, a more unique measurement of sound is devised and that is called a decibel. Decibel helps in comparing different sounds in terms of relative loudness or relative pitch. So, what is the decibel then? The decibel is equivalent to the sound pressure level. What is the pressure level of a sound at any point of time? That is how decibel is defined. And so, sound pressure level in decibel is expressed as the logarithmic of sound of interest which is P and the reference sound which is PR. So, if I want to compare two sound, one is this and the other is this and I want to express the difference between what is the change in decibel or what is the decibel of these sounds. What I have to do is divide the reference sound which is the first sound across which I am doing the comparison and then the sound of interest which is the larger sound and then take a logarithmic value of these two ratios to the base 10 and multiply it with 20. So, this definition and this equation will give you the decibel for any sound. Now, simple sounds from a tuning fork and complex sounds from a musical instrument. If you have ever heard a tuning fork, it makes very subtle sounds, very simple sounds, but sounds around us are not simple. They are a mixture of a lot of sounds and that is why we have two kinds of sounds or two varieties of sound. We could have a simple sound which could be equated to the tuning fork which can be expressed in terms of mathematical sine waves and then we have the complex sound which we get from musical instruments. Why this is complex? Because it contains multiple sound frequencies whereas the simple tuning fork has just one frequency which it is vibrating. The complex musical instrument has a number of frequencies added to the simple frequency and that is why it, it is a complex sound and so it has multiple sound frequencies of different amplitudes. So, how do we study a complex sound? A simple sound is easy because it is creating one sinusoidal simple sine function and it can be studied, but a complex sound when a number of frequencies integrate together this creates something called a square wave, a complex wave. So, how do we do the analysis of a wave like this? To our help came Fourier who was a mathematician and what he did was he explained that any complex sound can be broken down into its simple composing frequencies, component frequencies and this particular way of analyzing sounds 
is called the Fourier transform, the Fourier transformation. So, J. B. Fourier proposed that any complex waveform can be decomposed into its constituent simple sine waves when added together it will reproduce the original waveform. There is a very good lecture at the uh, MIT platform where I, I saw how easy it was to understand the Fourier theorem. If you get a chance get a look at that and it will explain to you how any complex waveform any complex sound can be broken down into its constituents simple sine waves that constitutes what is sound. Now, let us look at the human apparatus the ear and how do we hear sound. So, I have a diagram here which tells you about the ear if you can look the sound first arrives at the pina which is the outer surface of the ear. This is like the satellite dish which collects all sound waves and focuses it into the small auditory canal. So, this is my auditory canal. There are three parts of the ear, you have the outer ear, you have the middle ear and you have the inner ear. The outer ear collects in all sounds which are coming from various directions and sends it inside this auditory canal. This is the same canal which at the base is large and as it goes inside it narrows down. At the end of this canal which is away from the pinna are three different bones which is called the hammer, the anvil and the stirrup and they are put against the tympanic membrane or the ear drum in easy language and this ear drum then creates motion within the liquid which is inside this inner ear of the cochlea and hair cells on the basal membrane make motions because of which you hear. I do not worry, I will explain this one by one how does this whole function uh, looks like, but this is what the structure is. So, these are the three structures which help in transmitting the sound or air pressure which is entering the auditory canal into motions of the eardrum. The eardrum then expands and contracts and sends this signal onto a liquid which is flowing here and then the stationary waves and the moving waves in the within this liquid creates motion which is perceived by hair cells inside this structure which leads to the change in electrical potential across these hair cells and because of which you hear. So, this is the hearing part, but closely associated to the hearing part is the vestibular function or the vestibular sensory organ which help you in maintaining position and that is controlled by these semicircular canals which has a flowing fluid inside it and this fluid helps you in retaining your position. There are a number of theories which suggest how that happens, we will discuss that as well and this is the whole structure of the human ear. So, let us then try and understand one by one the human ear. As we discussed the human ear is divided into the outer, middle and the inner ear. The outer ear grabs information from the environment in terms of air pressure which is constantly changing and then directs it into the middle ear. The middle ear converts and transforms these air pressure in terms of simple vibrations of the eardrum and the inner ear then converts these to and fro motion of the eardrum into waves in a liquid and this is how you hear. Now, the outer ear has something called the pinna as we just un, uh, understood 
and this is what it is. It is an external structure of the auditory canal. It is like a satellite disc which focuses information inside the auditory canal through changes in air pressure. There is something called a tympanic membrane which is what is known as the eardrum in more general senses and it vibrates in response to the sound pressure. So, as the sound pressure or the changes in the air molecules enter the auditory canal, it is focused on to the eardrum and the eardrum responds or vibrates in response to this change in ear pressure. This action of the eardrum through the movement of the tympanic membrane is conveyed to the inner ear through ossicles in the middle ear. So, you have this tympanic membrane which is here. So, sound comes in here, the pressures are registered by this membrane and this membrane is connected in turn by in turn to three different structures, the hammer, the anvil and stirrup. These are three bones, smaller, very small bones attached to the eardrum and these vibrations of the eardrum. So, the air pressure and this is my eardrum, the eardrum is a stretched fabric or a stretched tissue and as it vibrates, these vibrations are converted through a three part mechanism a three liver mechanism which then conveys this information to the inner ear. So, the movement of the tympanic membrane or the eardrum is conveyed to the inner ear through the ossicles of the middle ear. Ossicles is the collection of three bones which are connected to the tympanic membrane or the eardrum. The ossicle comprises of three different structures, the malus, the incus and stapes which link the tympanic membrane to the oval window in the inner ear. So, within the inner ear you have the oval window and as you can see this is my eardrum and this eardrum is, con uh, is connected to the hammer here, the anvil here and the stirrup here and this all three bones they make motion and this motion is conveyed inside the oval window. This is called the oval window and inside this it is conveyed, this motion is conveyed to this part of the ear. Now, attached to the ossicle, these three bones are two muscles called tensor tympani and stapedius, which tighten to loud sounds thus protecting the ear. So, within the ossicle attached to this are certain membranes and the job of these membranes is to protect the ear from large sounds. How? By tightening itself. If a large sound comes in, these muscle tightens and it stops the conveying of information into the inner ear or inner mechanism of the ear. These two membranes are called the, ten, uh, the tensor tympani and the stipedius. So, how does it protect? It can protect you from those sounds which are loud and which is played for a period of time. But if it, if you have a sudden loud bang, these muscles will not respond because the response of these muscles are slow. They will be of no help for loud bangs. Now, the tightening of this muscle is called the oral reflex. This is something that is tested by audiologists when you have a bad ear when you have hearing problems, you go to audiologist and the audiologist looks at oral reflex and based on that he gives you those in ear micro uh, in ear ear pieces for you to or hearing aids as we call them to hear. So, what is this oral reflex? The tightening reflex, the tightening of the ten tensor tympani and the stipedius in response to large sounds or loud sound is what is called the oral reflex. It takes 35 to 140 millisecond for these muscles to tighten up and this is also the delay that these muscles 
create in the sound so that you do not destroy the inner mechanisms. So, this is the oral reflex. Now, the ossicles move in concert to the tympanic membrane level lever to the oval window of the inner ear. This should be liver. So, ossicles move in concert to the tympanic membrane and they liver to the oval window of the inner ear. As I said, these are connected to the inner ear. The inner ear has something called a cochlea, which is something like this. It is a coiled surface. If you open it up, it will become some 13 inches long. It is a coiled surface and it has three layers. The cochlea has three layers. Within that is a liquid which is flowing. So, cochlea consists of a coiled tube forming a small shape structure that houses receptors that encode sound. It is inside the cochlea that perception of sound begins. In the outer ear, in the inner ear, it is the air pressure which is being transformed into vibrations of the drum and then being translated through the ossicles into the inner ear. Within the inner ear, you have the cochlea which has three parts and a liquid flowing inside it and this is liquid helps you in encoding sounds. The cochlea uh, tube is segmented into three components. The central component contains the basilar membrane. This central although the other two components are also important, but the central component of the ear is called the basilar membrane and this membrane is the one which helps you in hearing because within this bas basilar membrane you have hair cells which encode the movement of waves on the liquid inside the ear and this is then transformed into the perception of sound. So, the central component of this cochlea is called the basilar membrane. Now, the basilar membrane is deformed when the liquid in the inner ear is displaced producing a wave like motion. So, the ossicles connected to the inner ear and this is where the cochlea is. There is a liquid which is flowing here and the inner part of if I unfold my cochlea it will look like this. So, there is a liquid which is flowing here and there is a layer or membrane here which is called the uh, basilar membrane. Within this basilar membrane are hair cells and there is a liquid which is flowing over it. So, the basilar membrane is deformed when the liquid in the inner ear is displaced producing a wave like motion. So, the, uh, when this gets connected, these, this section gets connected here, it will create motion and because of this motion, the liquid will start flowing and create a wave like motion. This wave like motion is what is read by the basilar membrane. Hair cells which is along the length of the basilar membrane are bent and thus initiate generation of electrical signals what travels along the auditory nerves to higher brain centers. So, this if this is my basilar membrane inside the cochlea and here are the hair cells. So, the liquid when it starts flowing, these hair cells will bend in response to the motion because this li liquid will create a motion and this motion will be perceived by these hair cells. These hair cells will then convert this motion into electrical changes which is then conveyed uh, to the auditory nerve fiber which takes this information and projects it into the primary visual cortex. These electrical signals are then conveyed through a branch and a bunch of neurons which is called the auditory neuron and they will then convey this electrical signal to the primary auditory cortex and then the secondary auditory cortex. So, this is how we hear. So, the mechanism of hearing is I hope clear to you, but hearing is just one part of the human auditory system. Another important part of the human auditory system is concerned with 
maintaining positions, maintaining your balance in the real world. You would have seen that people complain of something called car sickness or motion sickness, plane sickness or there are a number of people who have headaches when they quickly bend down. Also in some people maintaining an upright position or maintaining a straight position in related to the ground becomes difficult. All these people are suffering because the vestibular system is somehow not conveying the information that it should have conveyed. So, in addition to the hearing part, the auditory system also has the vestibular system. Let us look at the vestibular system and try and understand what it comprises of. Now, if you go back to the diagram of the ear, these three parts. So, if I rub it out here, this is my human ear and within the middle ear and middle and inner ear within this region, you have these three semicircular canals. This is the region which is responsible for vestibular function, which is maintaining body position. Right. So, let us look at what it is. These are the canals 1, 2 and 3 and these have liquids filled inside them and the motion of these liquids inside this canal help you in tracking your rotation of head and limb, tracking your position in relative to the ground and in relative to the environment around you. So, it has these canals, then there is a region which is called the ampule in which the liquid accumulates. These are tubercle ducts containing something called the endolymph and you have two muscles called the uticle and secule and which are also responsible for maintaining positions and this is my cochlea from the inner ear. Here also you have this liquid. So, let us understand how does this vestibular function and vestibular system work. Several structures in the inner ear including the three semicircular canals which is the anterior, posterior and horizontal canals and the otolithic organs comprises the vestibular system. So, this is my otolithic organ and these are my canals which are at 90 degree to each other. This is how the canals will look like and these are hollow tubes inside which liquid is flowing. So, these are in perpendicular to each other to represent the x, y and z axis. So, that you know your three dimensional space or your three dimensional position in relation to the environment. And how does this happen? Through this canals and the autolithic organs. Vestibular system provides information about the orientation of the body in space and about the orientation of motion of the head and body. While walking, or while driving or while making any kind of navigation, even if it is reaching out for an object in the external world, you need to know your position in relative to the position of an external object. When we were discussing visual cues, we looked at how depth cues are measured in terms of egocentric and relative depth cues egocentric distances and relative distances. So, these egocentric distances or relative distances gets Q from the vestibular system. The vestibular system says how far you are from some something and in what position you are against the object of interest. It gives you the orientation of the body in space whether it is 90 degree whether it is at some other angle and it also tells you about the orientation and motion of the head. 
this motion of the head is an important thing because some type of motions are generated by the motion of the head. Movies, there are 24 frames which moves, but the motion that is generated is because of the eye movement or the movement of the eyeballs. And so, this movement of the eyeball getting converted into motion, a part of it is also played by the vestibular system. So, vestibular system then give you your orientation. This kind of orientation help is necessary for maintaining a correct posture and maintaining motion in navigation. While you are falling, this type of information is more important. It lets your body prepare for the fall and it lets your body take all possible measures so as to minimize the fall. So, this kind of information is necessary. The three semicircular canals orient at right angle to each other to encode the rotation of the head in the x, y and z axis. So, whether I am rotating here and here, whether I am rotating up and down or whether I am rotating in and out, all these are monitored by these semicircular canals which are oriented at right angle to each other. Acceleration is detected by hair cells called the stereocilia, semicircular canal containing fluid. When we move our movement in relation to some other object which is stationary or the rate of change of movement that we do is called acceleration. This acceleration or the fact that we are moving against something else is coded by hair cells inside the semicircular canal which are called the stereocilia. If these were not present, motions would not be encoded and understood. Now, the autolithic organs which is the uticle and secule as I described before are located at the base of the canal and they detect linear acceleration and head tilting. So, the tilting of the head in any direction or the linear acceleration moving in a linear way are detected by these utical and secule which are certain organs which are present in the base of this autolithic organs. Autolithic basically means ear stones. How do they then code this? Just like as we saw that the basal membrane has hair cells which code sound patterns, how does this autolithic organs code motion? This happens in terms of how small calcium carbonate crystals are displaced. Let us look at it. So, autolithic uh, which are ear stones are small calcium carbonate crystals which are suspended above hair cells by a genitalis layer. So, a gelatin layer has certain calcium carbonate crystals which are lying atop of hair cells in the stereocilia. And when motion happens, the movement of these crystals occur and when you move, these hair cells also move because the liquid inside will move with your head. And once it does that, these small crystals will also move signaling motion. This is how motion is signaled. What is the importance of this vestibular system? In maintenance of balance, sense of spatial orientation and motion. Maintaining balance, some people fall too often because they are not balanced and some people are much balanced even if they fall, they break the fall by using some counter measures, some counter body movements. This counter body movements are initiated with the help from the vestibular system sense of spatial location. When you see a map or when you see yourself in the middle of a city, how do you orient yourself? Which is north? Which is south? Some people find it very easy because they get good help from their vestibular system and motion is also encoded by this vestibular system or the hair cells within the vestibular system. Now, input to parts of the nervous system that allow the musculature to make adjustments to maintain an upright position even when the ground below is moving. Why it is important? Because 
the input from the vestibular system helps you in maintaining the correct posture assuming that you are in a plane. Now, when in a plane the plane has motion or when you are sitting in a car the car has motion. How do you then position yourself so that you do not fall? This happens because an adjustment to the position of the body in relation to the position of an object on which it is sitting and which is moving is done through help from the vestibular system. The vestibular system gives information to the nervous system which helps us in making musculature muscle adjustment so that upright position is maintained even if the ground below or even in the object in which we are sitting is making a motion. So, that is the reason that you do not fall in a bus or moving bus or in an aeroplane. Vestibular system makes automatic correction to eye movements in the opposite direction of motion. This is important and this is called the vestibular ocular reflex. So, you are traveling in a car and there is a big billboard that you see. How do you maintain your focus? The car has a motion and your eyes also move because your body is moving. This happens because input from the vestibular system tells the eyeballs to make corrective adjustments so that you keep your focus on the billboard. The car, the speed at which the car is moving is adjusted in such a way in through the vestibular system that your eye movements or eyeballs do this correction so that focus is maintained. And this kind of reflex is called the vestibular ocular reflex. Corrective actions by the human eyeball to maintain focus of an external object when you are in an object which is moving is called the vestibular ocular reflex. Corrective VOR related eye movements are generated in the dark and even when the observer has his or her eye closed. So, even if we are not looking and not seeing anything, but we are moving in those cases also or even if it is dark when there is very less to perceive, very less light available to see, even in those times the VOR corrections are done and this basically suggests that perception or light does not need to be present for VOR correction or eyeball correction, eye movement correction with help from vestibular system. Now, one issue directly related to the vestibular system is motion sickness. Around you, you have seen a lot of people who complain motion sickness. They sit on car and they feel uncomfortable. They sit on a moving bus in a mountain, they feel uncomfortable. Some people have discomfort in terms of ringing sensation in the ear when they go on an airplane and all these are called motion sickness. So, why does this motion sickness happen? Now, by now you have guessed what could be the reason. One reason of motion sickness is that two different cues are interpreted differently and because both cues are giving you or both sensory organs are giving you conflicting information, motion sicknesses can happen. So, there are two theories and let us discuss these theories first. Now, the experience of discomfort as passengers on a moving car, boat on an aeroplane is termed as motion sickness. Motion sickness has a common underlying cause involving discordance between the vestibular and the visual cues. Your vestibular sense tells you something else. It tells you that there is no motion or there is some motion and the eyes tell you something else. You are sitting in an aeroplane. Clearly out of the window you can see that the aeroplane is bending or it is now moving up from the ground it is elevating, but when you look at your feet, it does not tell you that you have change in position or your position has changed. So, although the vestibular sense suggests that your body has changed in relative position to the ground, the visual cues would signal that uh, the plane has changed position, the vestibular cue will not signal this kind of a information. And these two cues will tell you two different things. So, the plane you can see changing position, but your body is not changing position. And these two cues will conflict with each other. And because of that, you will 
have a sensation which is called motion sickness. So, sensory conflict theory suggests that motion sickness arises when vestibular motion cues which is turning of the plane conflict with visual cues from the eye which is saying that no motion has appeared. Now, individuals without a functional vestibular system experience no such motion sickness. There is another theory which explains motion sickness and this is called the postular instability theory. In brief what this theory says is that body sways or body posture mo uh, motions of body posture is the reason for motion sickness. What it says is that body sways or instability accounts for motion sickness and not sensory conflict from the senses. It is not that the two senses are telling you something else. Your body position or your body movement is the reason for this sensory conflict. And the example given here is that drivers who sit with those passengers who have motion sickness do not feel motion sickness. The simple reason being that they know that something is happening or some kind of change is going to happen, the plane is going to turn. And so, what they do is they adjust the body before this turn, so that they do not feel this turn or they do not feel this sudden change in position and because of that they do not feel motion sickness. So, what it says is that drivers and pilots are less likely to experience motion sickness than passengers in the same vehicle. The simple reason is that unlike the passengers, the drivers or pilots can make anticipatory postural adjustments to compensate for vehicular motion. So, they know a turn is coming and so they will adjust, they will bend for the turn. Whereas, the postural adjustments of the passengers are delayed because they do not know the turn is coming. And because of this, they have imperfect postural position resulting in greater instability which in turn creates motion sickness. So, let us wind it up today here. In today's class, we discussed the auditory system and the vestibular system and how they work together. In the next class, we will look at the limitations and capabilities of the human auditory system in terms of how sounds are perceived and make meaning of, how pitches and frequencies are coded by the cochlea, how two different sounds are compared in the brain and we will also look at how auditory displays are designed. What are the principles which should be used while designing an auditory warning sign so that it helps the operator in doing better work in achieving great performance rather than getting confused with it and commit mistakes. Those suggestions which can help designing a more efficient auditory warning signal is something which we will deal in the next class. So, that is all for today. I am signing off from this MOOC studio. Thank you and Namaskar.